Well, hello, my friend, and welcome back to another episode of Catching Your Breath, the podcast. I'm Steve Austin, and I am so glad that you're here. You know, I haven't been publishing content as regularly as you're used to, certainly not as regularly as I'm used to. I, uh, In my friend circles, I am often called a content machine because I'm always putting out something new. But uh, in this season where I'm writing two new books, I just don't have the time to write two new books and create new podcasts and blogs and all that. However, I did just yesterday release a new blog, and it's all about how love is rooted in psychological safety. And maybe you say, what the heck is psychological safety? Or maybe you're just brilliant and you're like, oh, well, obviously it means what it says. Go check it out at catchingyourbreath.com. Brand new blog right there. What I'm sharing with you today is part one of a two-part series. And uh, it's actually from my trip to Canada. So on the Friday night of my Canada trip, I spent some time at Avenue Road Baptist Church. Shout out to my buddy, Pastor Lucas and all my friends at Avenue Road Baptist Church. So this first part is the talk that I gave on suicide and messy grace. And if you listen to the very next episode, it's going to be the Q&A portion of that talk. I don't always share the Q&As publicly. I don't, actually, I don't always record them. But this Q&A session was just really good. People texted in their questions, and I was able to respond. And uh, I think that it is a, a really good picture of the types of questions that I get often when it comes to life at the intersection of faith and mental health. So when you finish this one, I hope that you'll set aside some time to go check that one out too. Look, right before we dive in to this episode, I want to point you toward Patreon. If you go to patreon.com slash I am Steve Austin, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash I am Steve Austin. There's some new levels of support that you can go check out starting at a dollar and, and going on up. And uh, at any level, you get in on my private Facebook group where we are loving and supporting and lifting one another up and taking care of each other and being really brutally honest about our wounds and and just showing up every day. Uh, the other thing that I want to tell you about is uh, until February 28th, which is here in just a couple of weeks, uh, registration is open for my Spring Clean Your Life group coaching course. And as of the release of this podcast, there are still five slots available. There's 10 total. There are five left. And I'd love to have you. It's a 90-day group coaching program. We're going to get together once a week as a group and detox your life. And we're going to support each other while we do it. So check all of that out at catchingyourbreath.com. And here is the latest episode. Thanks for listening. We are going to talk about some heavy subject matter. Um, but I, I hope that you know, coming in, um, that you are safe, uh, that, that you are so appreciated just for being here. Like Aaron said, if you need to take care of yourself by getting up and stepping out at any point, zero judgments, a judgment free zone here. We're talking about messy grace a little later and messy grace definitely means no judgment. So take care of you. We are humans before we are anything else, before you're a mom or a dad or a liberal or a conservative or a man or a woman or a Christian or a Buddhist or a whatever you are, you're a human being and you got to take care of yourself. Okay. Let me tell you a little story. I'm actually going to read you a little story out of catching your breath. Here we go. When I was a little boy, my dad was my hero. One summer when I was five or six, we took a trip to Nashville for a few days to visit my dad's best friend. The hotel had a pool, and I distinctly remember standing on the stairs at the entrance to the shallow end when dad said, okay, ready to count? Let's see how high you can count and how long I can stay under. My dad, 
The career firefighter, the marathon runner, held his breath and slipped beneath the surface of the water. I watched him swim away toward the shallow end, turn and make his way back. For the first few seconds, it was so cool. But to a kindergartner, staying under past the count of 10 seemed either impossible or superhuman. He didn't come up for what felt like forever, and I was getting nervous. You know, 60 seconds seems like an eternity if you're just a small child. When my dad finally emerged and took that first gasp of fresh air, I was both relieved and amazed. I cheered, Dad, oh my gosh, I counted all the way to 60. How did you do it? As odd as I was to see my dad's trick, I always felt better when my hero was near me. The water was an uncertain thing to me. I knew I couldn't hold my breath and swim for it like he did. And I didn't like feeling alone. It's interesting. Children can't hold their breath as long as adults can. But the older we become, the longer we teach ourselves to hold it in. The same is true in life. Countless people are holding their breath and fears, just waiting to exhale. So my question for you is, how long have you been holding your breath? So some of you, I think statistics say one in five of you, have a mental health diagnosis. Maybe you don't know it yet. But whether you are diagnosed with something like depression or anxiety or bipolar, most all of us, if we've lived long enough, know what it's like to feel completely overwhelmed by life. I tell people often, you don't have to have a mental health diagnosis to have a meltdown. And if you haven't had one yet, just live a little longer. That's the good news. <laughs> Actually, it is the good news. Jesus said, in this world, you will have meltdowns. You will have trouble. But it's close enough. You will have struggles. You will fall flat on your face. You will drop the ball. Maybe would be a little more modern version. We want to jump past it and get to the, but take heart, I've overcome the world, right? That's what we do best in church. We talk about joy and victory and overcoming but what about the people who haven't overcome yet? What about the people who are still in the midst of the mess, the struggle, still in the pig pen, right? Eating out of a slop bucket. What do we do with those folks? We're not so great at sitting with people in struggle, prolonged grief, chronic illness, Things that we can't just put an olive oil cross on their forehead and pray for a miracle. Those things are tough for us most of the time. So we're going to talk about some of that tonight. We're going to talk about some of that tonight. So why are you here? I'm here because they paid me to be here. Why are you here? Maybe you're here with your spouse. They drug you along. Or maybe you're one of those youth group kids and the cute girl was going to be on the bus. I don't know. I was that guy one time. Um, I don't know why you're here, but I, I know that what I said a few minutes ago is very true. We're all human. And at the very core of who we are, we're desperate for authenticity. We're desperate for connection. We're desperate for people to take the mask off and tell the truth, the good, the bad, and the ugly, so that we can have permission to tell the truth, so that we can say, me too. It hasn't always happened that way if you've been in church very long. But the church ought to be the most safe place in the whole wide world to tell your truth, to say, I'm not okay and I haven't been okay for a long time. And I love Jesus with all my heart. And sometimes I want to die. Well, that's uncomfortable. But it's true for a lot of people. So, my friend Mike said, we're all doing one of the hardest things possible. Living. Living. It's not always easy. I go back to that Jesus thing. In this world, you're going to have trouble. It's not always going to be this smooth sailing 
thing. It's going to be tough sometimes. You're going to blow it. You're going to tick people off and disappoint people and hurt your kids' feelings. And, oh my gosh, not easy. So I hope that you're here because you long for that connection. You hope this crazy guy from Alabama is going to tell the uncomfortable truth and give you permission to do the same thing. Maybe you're looking for other safe people. Maybe you're a church leader and you want to know how to make your church an actual safe sanctuary. So that the sign out front that says, come just as you are, isn't our biggest lie, right? We should say it and mean it. So I hope that some of those are the reasons why you're here. I told you that one already. So let's talk about suicide for a little while. Here's some statistics. Aaron, if these are incorrect, tell me. These are the most recent I could find. Each day, an average of more than 10 Canadians die by suicide. Every single day. For every one person who dies by suicide, 20 more attempt. So we're talking 30 people trying to die by suicide every day. In Canada, you people are supposed to be like friendly and happy and easy going, but boy... 30 people a day. Second leading cause of death for ages 15 to 34. Anybody in that age range, 15 to 34? Yeah, it's supposed to be like the best time of your life, right? 15, you're getting your driver's permit, maybe your first car, first girlfriend, first boyfriend, right? 20s, you're in college maybe, or starting that first job. 30s, maybe you're finally figuring out your career and starting a family, and life is supposed to be just peachy. But it's not always peachy. A lot of struggle, a lot of pressure on our younger generation. And a lot of expectation and not a whole lot of support. So go love a young person. And then you see, it's not just our young people. The highest rates of suicide per age group, ages 40 to 59. You middle lifers, life is not always easy either. A lot of pressure, job and retirement, raising a family and supporting who knows how many. And oh man, a lot of pressure. So these statistics... This 2009 statistic has held true since then. In 2009 and every year since, approximately 100,000 years of potential life lost in one year. 100,000 potential years of life. Think about that. 100,000. Every year, One in five will experience some kind of mental illness, some sort of breaking point, some anguish. Maybe it's depression, maybe it's anxiety. It could be fill in the blank. But one in five, it's pretty incredible. And I love that we're talking about this in a sanctuary because this, not this one, but places like this, can be the most stigmatized place in the world when it comes to things like mental illness. Because even though we mean well, and we really do mean well, we're not always helpful when we say, just choose joy. Just choose joy. Just pray harder. If you just had more faith, right? We want to tell people, come on, buck up. You can do it. Just have more faith. Just ask Jesus to help. But we have to understand that mental illness is an illness. It's not a faith issue at all. It's not a spiritual issue at all. It's a medical issue. Your brain is not wired quite like everybody else's. So pray, yes. Go to church, yes. Join a small group, read your Bible, do all of those things because, my God, they're so important. But maybe you should also... Go to the doctor, start some medicine, go see a therapist, get help for the human side of you. And we don't talk about that enough in church. So I am incredibly grateful for these doors being open tonight and so glad that you're all here. My gosh. First time I heard the word suicide was in middle school. I'm the goofy guy in the green pants. 
Let's just take that in. Wow. Somehow he got married. I don't know. (laughs) I was in middle school. I was in uh, seventh grade. So 13-ish, I think, 12-ish, I don't know. And a sixth grade boy went home from school one afternoon and hung himself in his bedroom closet. I'd never heard the word suicide before. I didn't know someone could get to the point that they had no hope and decide the best thing for them to do would just be disappear. Just vanish. Stop being a burden on their family. That's what we think. Those are the messages we tell ourselves. But a 12-year-old, an 11-year-old, there was a story last year of this little boy, Jamel Miles, nine years old, being bullied at school because he finally had the courage to come out to his mom and say, Mom, I think I'm gay. And his mom was so proud of him and she gave him this great motivational speech and she sent him into school and he marched in school and told his friends just like he told his mama. And they bullied him so bad that he went home and did the very same thing. Nine years old. So it's not just that 15 to 34. It's not just the 40 to 59. It's every age group now. Fourth graders attempting or contemplating suicide. So we're going to talk some about what do we do? How do we help? Where do we go from here? How do we face this? How do we not just keep sweeping it under the rug? We've got to face this thing because it's an epidemic. Diseases of despair, they call them alcoholism, drug addiction, and suicide. It's an epidemic. So middle school is the first time I learned about it. Ninth grade, that poor guy still managed to get married. Ninth grade, my aunt died by suicide. My mom's sister, my favorite aunt in the whole world, Aunt Missy. Tall, thin, beautiful, blonde, looked like she walked off the set of Dukes of Hazard. She was fantastic, funniest person I'd ever known. Her daughters, my first cousins, were my first friends because I grew up in very rural, small-town Alabama, and your first cousins are usually your first friends. And we would play all summer and swim in their pool till we were brown as iced tea. (laughs) And I was in ninth grade. I guess it was the summer between ninth and tenth grade. And we were at this property where we were building a new house, my mom and I. My dad was working at the fire station. And we're walking around looking at the new construction. Two by fours are up, and that's about it at this point. And a police car pulled up. And this is 97? Yeah, 97. So my mom didn't have a cell phone yet. Police car pulled up and said, Miss Austin, you need to drive down to the fire station. Uh, Your mom has called. And my mom did this classic thing when something's wrong. She bit the inside of her lip, inside of her cheek. She bit to try to keep from crying. And she's done this all my life. And I know she's really upset if she's biting the inside of her cheek. She bit the inside of her cheek because she knew what the news was going to be. My aunt had been missing for three days. She was 38. Boy, I'll be 38 in a year. (laughs) She was 38. So we drove down the hill to the fire station and my mom walked in and picked up the phone off the wall. You 15 to 34 crowd, there used to be phones on the wall with a cord. (laughs) Strangest thing. She picked up the phone and she called my grandma. And all I remember is her screaming, my sister. And she dropped the phone and it swung back and hit the concrete wall. And she just collapsed into the floor. first time that suicide really became real for me. I was a pallbearer at her funeral. Probably too young to be a pallbearer, looking back. We set her down over the grave, and I turned around, and my dad was there, and I just collapsed into his chest and boohooed. And the thing that stands out the most to me is what church people said Afterward, 
Everybody's biggest fear was that she was burning in hell, right? That's an appropriate thing to talk about after somebody dies by suicide, right? No, no, it's not. Bad timing. Um, That was our biggest fear. And the truth is, the suicidal person is already living in hell. We're not afraid of what happens after we die because we're already there. You can give messages of weeping and gnashing of teeth and fire that never stops. But we're there now, right here in it, and we don't want to live anymore. So that hell thing you talk about, it's got nothing on what goes on in my head every night when I lay down and try to go to sleep. Or cry driving behind the wheel, driving down the road so nobody else will hear me, right? And scream at God, help me. There's this quote. I think it's the next slide. Yeah, Thich Nhat Hanh says, The definition of hell is simple. It's a place where there is no understanding and no compassion. We have all been to hell. We are acquainted with hell's heat, and we know that hell is in need of compassion. If there is compassion, then hell ceases to be hell. Let that one sink in. So you know somebody walking through a living hell, and you offer them a little cup of cold water in the form of compassion, and hell for them ceases to be hell. Whether they're suicidal, or they've just lost someone, or they've just walked through a divorce, they've been betrayed, whatever it is that has crushed their soul, when we show up, Jesus with skin on, and we show them some compassion, some mercy... Some messy grace. We get down in the dirt with them. And we don't do like Job's friends, right? We don't give them this seven day time limit. You got seven days and you got to be done with this thing. Like we stay with them as long as it takes. And we don't try to fix it. We don't offer them these pat answers because hurting people are sick of pat answers. We just sit. Maybe the most we say is, tell me what you need. Tell me what you need. And it may be nothing. It may just be your presence sitting right there beside them. Bringing them supper, right? Just compassion. That's how we turn hell around. Compassion. So, now we get into my story. I'll read you a little pinch out of this one. Preparing to die is surreal. I'm not sure how to even describe it. Imagine a dreamlike nightmare, something fantastically terrible. In some ways, I felt like a marionette watching my hands scribe the darkest letters imaginable. I knew the choices I was making. I comprehended the secret plans I was devising, the dastardly deed that would forever mark my life as a failure. Yet it felt like my hands worked independent of my mind. I knew my death would hurt my family and friends. They'd be shocked, miserable for a while. But life does go on. They would be okay without me. They would have no choice. If you've never lived through the hell of sleepless nights, been strangled by the cold hands of anxiety, you can't understand why someone would want to die. You can't possibly get it if you've never heard that scream whisper of depression that rarely backs down or felt the sting of worthlessness, no matter how hard you work. The constrictive wash of shame over your soul at a red light for absolutely no reason. The weight of guilt that you just cannot escape no matter what you do. If you've never felt any of these things, you cannot comprehend planning your death. I know y'all thought it was going to be comedy hour tonight. Sorry. So let's back up. How do you get there? How do you get to writing your suicide notes on one leg and your Bible open on another leg sitting on a hotel room two hours from home? How do you get there? So it starts way back when I was a preschooler. And I was molested 
by the neighbor boy. I was three or four and he was 17. And I didn't remember it for 14 years. I was a senior in high school. The first time I had a flashback, that dream-like nightmare when you're wide awake. And I went home that afternoon and I told my mom these things I was seeing and these smells and these sounds. And it's like I was right there in it. Well, later I learned that's big T trauma. When you're right in it and it feels like you're there and you're experiencing it all over again, that's big T trauma. So I'm explaining these things to my mom. And it's the first time in my life that I remember my mom not making eye contact with me. And I thought, that's odd. My mom, my best friend, my cheerleader, my confidant. She wouldn't make eye contact with me. She started crying. I later find out that she realized she was wrong. That that little three-year-old boy did remember. And they didn't do anything about it. Now, they didn't do anything about it because they didn't care. No, no, no. They were very, very young when I was born. And this abuse happened one time. And they thought innocently, naively, ignorantly, that this little tiny boy is never going to remember this. So why put him through having to talk to social workers and police and go to CPS and do all of this. Let's just move on. And so in tiny rural Alabama, they threatened this teenage boy within an inch of his life and said, don't ever step foot on our property again or we'll go to the police. Because they knew that his father was a raging alcoholic and they were scared for what might happen to this boy. Now, parents... If you find out that your child's been abused, don't do what my parents did. I love them, and we have worked through it, and they are great parents, and they made a huge mistake. If your child or your grandchild or your niece or your nephew comes to you and says, this has happened, you have to involve the authorities. You have to get them help. Because the truth is, it happened one time, but I've relived it day after day after day. The flashbacks come, the memories come, something triggers it, and I'm there all over again. And I'm 37 standing in front of you, but as it's going on, I'm three standing in a side yard at my home. So it doesn't ever just only happen one time. So I tell my mom, and she does what any good fundamentalist mom would do, and she prays and pleads the blood of Jesus, take away these memories. Amen, and we don't talk about it again. And it was about 12 more years before we talked about it again. I was 29, a pastor, worship leader, a father. My little boy was a year old. <laughs> Why, she got a Georgia shirt on. Anyway, I was 29, a pastor, a worship leader working as a sign language interpreter in the school system. Everybody's biggest cheerleader, everybody's biggest fan, everybody's friend, the guy who was on top of the world could work the room and make everybody feel better. And everybody thought I was on top of the world. And they didn't know it felt like the world was on top of me. And I lost a school job that I had at the time. I was still working at the church, but I lost this school job that I thought I would retire from. I thought this is, this is the job. I was working at a um, vocational training facility for um, deaf adults who'd graduated high school and, and needed a, a trade school of sorts. And I thought, this is where I'll retire from. I'm the staff interpreter. I love this. I'll do it forever. And uh, lost my job. And that really sent me into a tailspin. I already had the PTSD going on, all these flashbacks. I had the anxiety. I had the depression. I had the fear of anybody finding out because no one knew that I was suffering with mental illness. You think it's bad enough being in the pews and suffering and not want anybody to know. Well, put pastor in front of your name. Everybody expects you to have it together, to have all the answers, to know exactly what to do, to never have a bad day, to never complain, right? And you sure can't tell any of your pastor buddies 
because they're itching for your job or they're going to gossip just like sister so-and-so on the prayer chain, right? So, so you can't talk to anybody. You can laugh. It's good. Laugh. So it's good. <laughs> but it is so isolating when we believe that the only way God loves us and approves of us and has a place for us at the table is if we have it all together. It's all based on outward performance, outward behavior, what I look like. I got to say the right thing. I got to know when to stand, sit, kneel, do the cross, whatever I got to do. If I can do all of that and stay on tune for the most part when we're singing, I'm good. But if I ever let my guard down, if I ever let them know all my fears, the shame that I'm feeling, the anxiety that keeps me up at night, if I ever, if they ever find out I'm done for, And these are not just fears. It happens every day. Go read the Wall Street Journal from three or four days ago. This pastor, Brady, from Texas, he asked for a sabbatical because his mental health was at a fever pitch. He was not doing well at all. And he asked for a sabbatical and he got one. And he got a diagnosis of bipolar while he was out. And they let him go. Now, he was getting healthy. He was getting treatment. He was taking care of himself as a human being. And they said, oh, no, 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 no. we can't have somebody like that behind the pulpit. Heaven forbid we have somebody with struggles behind the pulpit, right? Everybody needs to look like Joel Osteen, have those shiny teeth, and isn't Jesus, right? Yeah, that's what we think. So, I'm in a hotel room two hours from home. I'd taken a contract job because I had to support my family. And I've got the mental illness at a fever pitch. I've just lost the job, so I'm dealing with this rejection. I'm all alone for two weeks in a hotel, two hours from home, and I'm in what Brene Brown calls the shame spiral. Any Brene Brown fans? Yes, hallelujah, we can be friends. Brene Brown, daring greatly, the gifts of imperfection, rising strong, braving the wilderness, they will change your life. Wonderful, wonderful books. If you're not a reader, just go look her up on YouTube, Brene, B-R-E-N-E, Brene Brown. Her work, uh, we did some e-courses, Lindsay and I, with her after the suicide attempt. Her work changed my life, changed our marriage more than therapy. Love my therapist, still go every week. But her work changed my marriage and my life even more than therapy at the time. Renee Brown. Okay, so I'm in this hotel room for two weeks. And I'm working, you know, nine to five-ish. Um... And I'm, I'm there in this hotel, let's say 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. every night by myself, mental illness completely out of control, feeling rejected from losing my job, all by myself. And the shame is just spiraling out of control. And what is shame? I'm not enough. That's the lie that shame says. I'm not man enough. I'm not Christian enough. I'm not sane enough. I'm not strong enough, right? Those are the lies that shame tells us. All the ways that we're not enough. And so I finally said, man, the best thing I can do would just be to disappear. To just melt into the ground. Let this beautiful 27-year-old girl find a normal husband and start over. Let this precious little one-year-old boy have a new daddy, a normal daddy. One of the worst words in the English language. What is normal? But let him find a new daddy and start all over. So people say, suicide's the most selfish thing you can do. But it doesn't feel selfish when you're in that moment. It feels like the most selfless thing you could possibly do. I'm not saying it's selfless. I'm not saying they're right, but that's what it feels like. It feels like you're doing everybody else a favor. So don't tell people suicide is selfish. It's a lie. And it's shameful. Interesting to note, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane experienced loneliness, rejection, right? He's there 
all by himself. His best friends can't even stay up and pray with him and keep watch. He says, my soul is crushed to the point of death. Just stay up and keep watch with me for a little while. He's in mental anguish. No, I'm not saying Jesus was suicidal. Come on. But he is at the lowest point Jesus has ever been at. God, if there is any other way, please don't make me walk through this. I can't do this. And all my friends are over there sound asleep. I'm alone. So depression and loneliness, my friend Robert Vore says, is a deadly cocktail. So if you know people depressed or in any kind of mental anguish, don't leave them alone. Don't leave them alone. We need to hear from you compassionate, hope-filled folks who have suffered, who will say, hey, I've been there. Or, hey, I haven't been there, but I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. I'll love you through this as long as it takes. That's what we need to hear. So, messy grace, my favorite thing in the whole world to talk about. I woke up and I see you about... 24 hours after the fact. Was numb from the waist down. Couldn't feel my legs. I'd taken so many pills. They thought my liver was going to fail. Spent three days in ICU. And then spent a week on the psych ward. My wife is driving me home. And I'm watching those green, I don't know what color they are here. I haven't paid attention. But green interstate signs going by over my head. And all I can think is, what do I do tomorrow? I'm a failure of a father, a husband, a pastor, a human being. I couldn't even get a suicide right. What do I do tomorrow? And will I ever be able to go back to church again? It's really sad if you think about it. Shouldn't that be the place we're running? To God's house? To God's loving, kind, compassionate, embracing, all welcoming. We don't care who you are, where you're from, what you've been through. Just come and be loved. Come as you are. And I was scared to death to go back to church. We got home. And we're sitting on the couch. Isn't she gorgeous? We're sitting on the couch. And it's really quiet. Because she doesn't know what to say. I sure don't know what to say. And finally she breaks the silence and she says, I'm not leaving you. I'm not leaving you. And I started doing this. (laughs) I started bawling my eyes out. What do you mean you're not leaving me? Don't you know what a screw up I am? Don't you know what a failure I am? Don't you know how many times I've covered this up so you wouldn't know how bad I was, how messed up I was, how hurt I was, how weak I was? Don't you? I'm a total loser. That's how I felt worthless. And here she is saying, I'm not leaving you. And I said, What do you mean? And she said, If you will tell the truth, If you will go to therapy, if you will ask for help, if you will never lie again, if you will admit when you're not okay, even if that's every day for the rest of our lives, if you will just ask for help, I'm not leaving. And she became the tangible grace of God to me in that moment. I'd never hated myself more. I'd never wanted to run more. I still had thoughts of, man, maybe there's a better way. Maybe I can get out here and not fail the suicide attempt next time. And she said, no, I'm not leaving. I'm not giving up on you. She said, I believe in the truly good man that I married. And here's my favorite line. I don't believe the worst day of your life gets to define the rest of your life unless you let it. I don't believe that the worst day of your life gets to define the rest of your life unless you let it. I thought I was the preacher. (laughs) Matthew 11, 28 through 30 in the message says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. 
I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Well, that's the message. We can go home now. Jesus said, just come hang out with me. Just come watch how I do it. I get overwhelmed by the crowds too and I go and I get away. I get really tired and I crawl down in the bottom of a boat and I take a nap. Right? First miracle after the resurrection, he's frying up food for his friends on the seashore because they're hungry. They've been fishing all night. He's a real guy. And he knows that in this world we will have trouble. And he overcomes because he's lived it. That's the hope. That's the hope. Hey friend, real quick. If you know what it's like to feel hopeless. If you know what it's like to think about writing those suicide notes. Running away, disappearing and never coming back. I want to tell you that there is hope. And if you need help. I want to tell you how you can save 10% on therapy, your first month of therapy, through BetterHelp. So BetterHelp is an app which is affordable therapy on your terms. You can save 10% when you sign up for BetterHelp by going to catchingyourbreath.com slash BetterHelp. It's catchingyourbreath.com slash BetterHelp. You can talk with a licensed professional therapist online right from your smartphone. It's affordable, private, online counseling anytime, anywhere, and it's the therapy I use every single day. So if you're looking for help, if you're looking for hope, go to catchingyourbreath.com forward slash BetterHelp today. My buddy Devin Ballroom wrote this song. You can Google it called weak sometimes it's in the whole thing. I love it so much that the whole thing's in this book, <laughs> every word, but it says you're put together. You're so well and put together that even on your tragic days, you seem fine. You try so hard to hide. that There's a fight inside, but I can see it in your eyes that you're not fine. Who ever said it was wrong to be weak sometimes? To cry yourself to sleep and wake up with your tears barely dry. You might feel like you're dying. That the end is nowhere near in sight. But who ever said it was wrong to be weak sometimes? Jesus' best buddy Lazarus is dead. Been dead a few days, lying in the grave. And Jesus is sobbing, crying, grieving, right? We know it ended well. But we see Jesus allowing himself to be human, allowing himself to be weak. So we have to give ourselves permission to be human, learning to be human. That's what I had to do post-suicide attempt. I had to learn how to take the mask off, let my guard down, ask for help, admit when I'm not okay, set boundaries. I can even spell boundaries. What is that? So it started with individual counseling. I was going to individual counseling every week. Simultaneously going to marriage counseling with my wife every week. Changed my life. Saved my life. Continues to save my life. Because here's the thing. You see this guy up here today, right? All good. And making jokes and and teaching and giving out information. You think, oh man, he was depressed and now he's not. No. No. I still take a little white pill every morning and every night because my brain is not quite wired like everybody else. I still live with depression. I still live with anxiety. I still live with PTSD. But I am more than my diagnosis. And that's the hope. I have depression, but I am not depression. I am so much more than that. I have anxiety, but I am not anxiety. I have PTSD, but I am not PTSD. I am so much more than the worst day of my life. And learning to say that out in the open, right? I have mental illness and so can you, right? But to be able to say it and talk about it and normalize it, just like my dad, right? I talked about the career fireman, the marathon runner, who's in better shape at 60 than I am at almost 40. Today, he's in great shape. He still runs six miles three times a week. And he has to take cholesterol medicine. 
Well, he eats so healthy. He exercises constantly. He looks fantastic. And he's at my daughter's birthday party talking about his cholesterol medicine. And it's no big deal. I'd never feel comfortable, at least at that point, saying, Oh, yeah, I had to change my depression meds. We don't talk about those things, right? But we should. We should talk about it. Because one in five of us, and then those, for every one that dies by suicide, 20 more attempt. Think of how many survivors there are because of that. For every one person who dies by suicide, the average is six to seven survivors directly impacted. Whether it's parents, children, a spouse, a best friend. Six to seven survivors for every one person who dies by suicide. So we've all been impacted. Or nearly everybody. How many people have been impacted by suicide or a suicide attempt? Look at that. More than half, easily. So it's all of us. So learning to be human is going to counseling. Boundaries. 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 Oh my gosh. So... For the pastors in the room, (laughs) it's really hard for us to say no. We're expected to not say no. We're here, right? Every time the doors are open, we got to go visit the hospital. We might have to preach four funerals on a bad week, right? Oh, there's weddings and there's counseling and there's Sunday morning, Sunday night, Sunday school, filling in for this. Oh, heaven forbid the church disputes, right? We got all these things on our plate and we can't say no to any of them or ever complain or ever have a bad attitude. Pastors are really bad at boundaries. But so are moms, and usually so are dads, and so are sons and daughters. And so learning to say no is such a gift. It's not a four-letter word. It's a two-letter word. And Byron Katie says, when I say no to you, I'm actually saying a really big yes to myself. When I say no to you, I'm also giving you permission to show me who you really are. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. People get real ugly when you tell them no sometimes. You see the dark side. Ooh, it's scary. That's why I'm not a pastor anymore. Anyway, self-care. <laughs> self-care is another way that I gave myself permission to be human. I get to swoop in and go, love you, love you, love you, love you. Gotta go. Anyway, self-care. So self-care is super basic, like eat enough green veggies, right? drinking enough water we are chronically dehydrated around the globe and if you look at the studies one percent just one percent not enough water look at what it does to your systems look at what it does to your brain look at what it does to things like anxiety so drink enough water eat enough green veggies get enough sleep none of us sleep enough almost none of us sleep enough get enough sleep go to therapy get a massage Go for a walk. Oh my gosh. 10 minutes of a brisk walk. Just 10 minutes. All those endorphins start going. You start feeling better. You snap out of that funk you were in. And it's like, what happened? Might be Jesus. It might be that you put shoes on and went for a walk. So, self-care. And then messy grace. So what is it? Messy grace. For me, it has been the transition from fear-based theology to love-based theology. So that fear, shame, and guilt that keeps us in the pews every Sunday, that fear, shame, and guilt that keeps us putting money in tithes, so hopefully it'll let us inch in when we get to heaven, right? Fear, shame, and guilt. That's all I learned growing up. I knew more about hell than I ever knew about Jesus. Scared to death of what was going to happen after I die. I can't tell you how many times I prayed to get re-saved growing up. Oh my gosh. So my friend Ed Bacon wrote this great book, Eight Habits of Love. And he talks in this book about the house of fear and the house of love. And you can't have one foot in the house of fear and one foot in the house of love. You can't do it. But perfect love casts out fear. So people think I'm kind of heretical when I believe that God loves every single one of us exactly as we are. Brennan Manning says God loves you as you are and not as you should be because you're never going to be as you should be. And when we start admitting that and inviting everybody to the table, because Jesus said, come, come, right? Everybody. And yes, I mean them too. Everybody. 
That's my theology today. That God loves us and there's nothing we can do about it. So it changes things. When you've got that fear-based theology that every little thing I do is going to condemn me to eternal conscious torment. And I'm going to suffer in hell forever. Boy, it can really have an impact on your mental health. I promise. So finding this God who is involved in my life, who wants me to take care of myself, who loves me right where I am, and I don't have to perform. That was it for me. It was performance-based Christianity. And I don't have to do that anymore. I'm going to blow it. I'm sure I did today, and I guarantee I will tomorrow. And that has no bearing on God's love for me or you. I don't care how great you are or how bad you've blown it. It doesn't change God's love for you right where you are. So that's been a big one for me. Um, A couple more things and I'll fly through these. Belonging versus fitting in. This is Brene Brown, not me. Brene Brown, remember her? She's great. She talks about the difference in belonging and fitting in. So fitting in is what I did all my life up until I was 30 years old. You walk in and you survey this room of, what, 80 people. And you go, all right, th- those are the talkers. The nerds are over there. Everybody back there is on their phone. Boy, these people are really loud. Where am I going to? F- oh, okay, I'm going to go here and I'll fit in there. And I figure out who have I got to be like to be accepted. Well, that's the polar opposite of belonging Where I just show up and I'm accepted. I'm just accepted. Right? And you're accepted. you got to accept yourself first. But we're just accepted. And what if we believed that? So, belonging. Hope is the thing with claws. All this fits under the umbrella of messy grace. So somebody, it was a poet, she's famous, can't remember her name. But she said, hope is the thing with feathers. That's all cute and, oh, look, you know, it's a dove or something. I think hope is the thing with claws. I think hope is the thing that digs in and says, not on my watch. I'm not letting go today or I'm not letting you go today, right? I see you struggling. I see you crying your eyes out. I know you're depressed. I know you've been out of meds for two days and you're really struggling. I'm not letting go. That's hope to me. Hope is, ooh, hope is things I can't say in church. Hope is bad. Hope is bad. Telling the uncomfortable truth and being loved anyway. And asking for help even when it hurts. All of those things fall under the umbrella of messy, messy grace. The God of the prodigal son that meets us in the pig pen, gets down in the mud, gets dirt under his or her fingernails because God loves us and isn't willing that any should perish. That's messy grace. And it's changed my life. Now what? Now what? Now what do you do with all this? Do you go out there and fan the flames of hell and judge and criticize or not do anything? Just not get involved. We'll not get involved in that. That's too messy. Or Do you become a person of compassion? A person who loves the hurting and the brokenhearted and the crushed, the lonely, those on the margins who would never be welcomed in our church. That's your choice. Are you going to make life more of a living hell? Or are you going to turn that hell into heaven on earth by accepting and loving and supporting everybody you can, including yourself? you got to take care of yourself. Hey friend, don't forget to check out this very next episode. It's a faith and mental health frequently asked questions episode. I'll see you there.